Good afternoon, church. My name is Ryan. My name is Joseph. And this is Sunday Online. Yeah, and it's so awesome that you've joined us online for church today. Mm. And if this is your first time joining us, then why not head over to our website, specifically our Next Steps page. Mm. There is a form that you can fill out and a member of our team will be in touch with you. Now, Ryan. Yes. We clearly got the memo today, mm. both in black. Yes. So I was thinking, like, what is your favourite colour just to wear in general, in like general. clothing wise? Um, as you can see, we're in black, mm. but outside of black, I would say a navy blue. Yourself? Navy blue. It's very similar to black, isn't it? I know. I'm black all day long. Mm. I, most of the clothes I own are black. Okay. Yeah, wow. literally. <laughs> Why is that? Um, it's just simple, practical. Mm. I can blend in, you know. <laughs> That's fair. Anyway, why don't you, if you're with someone right now watching, why don't you tell them what your favourite colour mm. to wear is and um, as we do that and uh, have fun, we're going to worship the Lord together. Thank you band for a fantastic time of worship. If this is your spiritual home or this is your first time and you've been blessed by everything that we're doing, a QR code will pop up on the screen with the different ways in which you can give into the life of the church. Yeah, awesome. And yeah, as he said, if it is your spiritual home, then thank you so much to those mm. who do give and those that want to give into the life of the church. We're gonna continue our service and see everything that is happening now with Church Life. My name is Paige and this is Church Life. Coming up,
summer we have the baptisms which is on the 6th of November and the classes will be held on the 23rd of October. So if you'd like more information, you can either head over to our website or go to the information point. Today we have our New to Church event. It's for anyone that's joined us in the past six months. So if you'd like to come along, make sure you join us after our 12.15 service today. This week is Connect Group Week. So if you don't have a group already, make sure you sign up to one because it's gonna be great fun. Hey Church, hope you are doing well. Just want to give you some information about the lock-in which is taking place on the 21st of October, straight after Apex Friday night. Now, please help me help you. We are finishing at 7.45 on the Saturday. So please, please, please bring, make sure you are there to pick up your children. That would be fantastic. But it's gonna be a great night. Make sure uh, you've signed up your kids, five pound per person. Use the QR code or go to the website. We'll see each other soon. So if you need any more information, make sure you head over to our website. Have a great week. Goodbye. So great to be in the house of God this morning. Just give me a moment while I just prepare myself and put things in the right places so I feel comfortable. If we haven't met, my name is Ade, and it's my privilege this morning to be starting a new sermon series that we're doing called, I Have Decided. I Have Decided, dot, dot, dot. If you're watching online, get ready, get ready, get ready, get your Bibles out, we're getting in for a good time. If you have your Bibles in the room, why don't you turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter six, uh, verse one to three. Hebrews chapter six, verse one to three. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, not because it's the best version, but simply because it's my favorite version and I'm the one speaking, so. <laughs> Hebrews chapter six, verse one to three. This is what it says. No, I do that. I almost sent it to the room. Feeling more comfortable. I feel at home. There we go. You only do this when you feel at home. Hebrews chapter six, verse one to three. Therefore, leaving the discussions of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, or the doctrines of baptism, of the laying of hands, of resurrection from the dead, of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. Quickly going back to verse 2. Of the doctrines of baptism. The doctrines of baptism. Uh, this morning I want to speak to us on a very simple topic, and it's this. I have decided to get baptized. I have decided to get baptized. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you because you're here right now. We ask that you would go through every aisle, go through every row, touch every single soul. But I put your word in my heart. I pray that you wrap me around your Christ. None of me and all of you. Think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords. Lord, we pray that we will be changed, we will be encouraged, we will be empowered, we will be equipped to be the people that you're calling us to be in the mighty name of Jesus and somebody who believed it said, <coughs> amen. Uh, I, I'm sure this has happened to many of you. Uh, this is the thing, well, this thing being that uh, if you've got children, it's probably happened to you because it's happened to me, uh, where you've given someone a choice to make a decision and it's taken forever to make that decision. I can hear people nudging their neighbor, looking at their partner and go, that's you, that's you. It happened to us recently. I've got a young son, and I recently we were trying to say, take, give him an opportunity to choose what treat he's going to have after dessert, um, for dessert, what treat after dinner he was going to have. And he's looking at the treat, and keep in mind, there's only two choices. There's toffee, and there's a biscuit. Toffee and biscuit. It's not... It's not that hard. And so I'm looking at him and he's dilly-dallying and after a while I have had enough and I look at him like, mate, if you don't make a decision, I will make one for you. And all the parents said, amen. And needless to say, straight away he made a decision and it was peace and calm in the Ayoko household. And I thought, and I thought to myself, finally, here we go. I, I say all that to simply let us know that in life we are required to make decisions. In life we are required to make decisions. We make decisions about where we're going to live. We make decisions about which career we're going to have. We make decisions about who we're going to marry. 
We make decisions about what we're going to study at university. We make decisions about which clothes we're going to wear. We make decisions about which Netflix show we're going to binge. Not you guys, maybe just me. Uh, we, we make decisions about what hairstyle we have. Actually, some of us, it's genetics decides for us. Amen. Wow. That's true, it's true, I'm just saying. <laughs> right? The reality is that we have to make decisions. In fact, I am told that we make 122 informed decisions every single day. Now, that is a lot of decisions. They are decisions of things of significance. They are decisions of things that are not significant. And the reality is this that our life is a sum total of all the decisions we make yeah. and all the decisions that we do not make. If we make a decision or we do not make a decision, so if we make a decision, that is awesome, and if we don't make a decision, one is made for us. Which brings us to our text, because the writer of Hebrews is doing this thing, he's making a case, he's saying to Christians and believers like you and I, saying that we have to make a decision to move from spiritual immaturity and to move to spiritual maturity. That we make, we make a decision to move from the milk of God's word to move to the meat of God's word. That we need to make a decision to move from the elementary teachings of Christ to move to understanding the whole counsel of God. And I want you to know this morning, friends, that whether you've been a Christian for two weeks or whether you've been a Christian for two months or whether you've been a Christian for two years or 20 years, we have a decision to make. We need to make a decision to move from the elementary teachings of faith to move into the fullness that God has for us. We need to make a decision to take our next step in God. We need to make a decision to make sure that we're enjoying the fullness of everything God has for us. We have a decision that needs to be made. And I love it because the writer of Hebrews doesn't just encourage us and urge us to move towards spiritual maturity, but he begins to lay the foundations of some principles, some, some doctrines, if you would, some concepts that we need to understand so that we can move towards spiritual maturity. For example, he says to, uh, let's see if I can break this down. Uh, you know when you're in school, there's some things that you need to understand before you can go to the next level, go to the next grade, or maybe you're at university, there's some basic things that if you don't get, they don't let you move on. For example, you need to know how to count to go to the next level. You need to know how to do plus and minuses and multiplication and division and times table. This is the world that I'm living in right now. I've got a daughter who's learning at 11 times 3 is 33 so that she can move to year 4 in the following year because you need to understand the basics so that you can move on. And the writer of Hebrews is saying that in that same way that there's some things about the Christian faith, there's some doctrines of the faith that we need to understand so that we can move towards spiritual maturity. He says to us that we need to understand the doctrine of faith and repentance. Let me break that down for you. The doctrine of faith and repentance. That we need to have an understanding that we need to repent from our sin. That we need to understand that we need to turn 180 degrees from the things that grieve God. That we need to turn from making sure that we rely on ourselves for our own salvation. But rather we need to rest in the finished work of the cross and put our faith in Jesus. The doctrine of faith and repentance. That we need to understand the doctrine of the laying of hands. That we need to know within ourselves that there is a supernatural transaction that takes place when a hand is laid upon us or we lay hands upon somebody else. That through the laying of hands, the healing is released. That through the laying of hands, spiritual gift is imparted. That through the laying of hands, that an impartation from heaven is received. That the power of God flows when we lay hands on someone in faith, the doctrine of the laying of hands. Are you still with me, ladies and gentlemen? He tells us that we need to understand the doctrine of resurrection and eternal judgment. That because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross 2,000 years ago, because he resurrected from the dead, that those of us that are Christians, those of us that are believers of Jesus, those of us who choose to follow him in every area of our lives, that because of what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago, that one day, coming soon, that we will resurrect from our body, that death no longer has any sting, that the grave no longer has any power, that the grave has lost its victory because there's a resurrection that is coming our way, the doctrine of resurrection, but also added to that is the doctrine of eternal judgment. It is simply the fact that at some point in time, the whole world is going to be judged. We are going to be judged. And based on that, there's going to be some eternal consequences to whether we made a decision for Jesus and lived for him or whether we lived without him. And he goes on to say that not only do we need to know the doctrine of faith and repentance, the doctrine of the laying of hands, the doctrine of eternal judgment and resurrection, but that we need to know the doctrines of baptisms. 
And this is where I want to land today. I, I want you to catch this, that it says the doctrine of baptisms. Meaning that there is not just one baptism. And the second thing I want you to see in this passage of scripture is this. That the word baptism that we see in the text is the Greek word baptizo. Baptizo, which simply means to be fully submerged in something or to be immersed in something. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the, the product or the clothing material known as tie-dye uh, or tie and dye. Uh, if you're not, it's coming up on the screen. Yeah, there it is. It was really popular in the 60s and the 70s with the hippie generation. Come on, somebody. And it was fun and lovely. And historically speaking, the process of creating tie-dye was simply this. That you would take a piece of cloth, you would submerge it in dye until it kind of contained... Oh, that kind of worked-ish. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> that was white and now it is fully red-ish. The thought being that it carries and contains in it the content of the dye in the product, the submersion. And here's the cool thing. That just as the beautiful tie and dye is created through the act of submersion, something happens to the life of the believer who doesn't just understand the concept or understand the doctrines of baptism, but actually fully experiences the doctrines of baptism. And so with the last few minutes we have together, what I want to do is look at some of the doctrines or some of the baptisms that we see in Scripture. The first one, if you're taking notes, is this, that there is something called the baptism or, the, or water baptism, baptism in water. What is water baptism? Water baptism is simply the act of being fully submerged in water as a result of our faith in Jesus. Let me say it again. It's the act of being fully submerged in water because of our faith in Jesus. It is not a christening. Because at that point, you haven't made a decision for Jesus. It is not a sprinkling of water on your head. No, it has been fully submerged in water as a result of our faith in Jesus. Listen to this. I, I believe uh, Mark chapter 1 is going to speak to us. Mark chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 says this. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. Acts chapter 8, verse uh, 33 and 39 says this, As they traveled along the road, they came by some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? So he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Verse 39, and when they came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him again, and went on, on his, or went on his way rejoicing. I want you to see very quickly, the water baptism is the act of being fully submerged in water as a result of one's faith in Jesus. But it's an act that carries full spiritual significance. It's an act that proclaims to us that we have received by faith the forgiveness of sin and eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ. All throughout the Bible, we see this connection. That when we see water baptism, there's a connection to receiving and accepting the forgiveness of sin and the eternal life that comes through Jesus. In, we read it with the eunuch in Acts chapter 8. We see this principle play out. In Acts chapter 16, we see this principle play out. When the, when the jailer uh, decides to give his life to Jesus, he and his family, the first thing they do is get water baptized because water baptism speaks to us and lets us know that we have been forgiven of our sins and we are recipients of eternal life in Christ Jesus. Not only does water baptism tell us that we're forgiven of our sin, water baptism tells us that it's a symbol of the reality that you and I, spiritually speaking, have died in Christ and we've also resurrected in him. Uh, Romans chapter 6 puts it this way. I, I love this. Romans 6 verse 3 and 4 says, Or have you forgotten that you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism? You were joined in him in his death. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, just as Christ was, sorry, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may live new lives. Friends, water baptism is a symbol, a physical symbol of the fact that we died in Christ and now we're alive in God. It's a picture, if you would, that you and I, it is no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. And the life that we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God who loves us 
and died for us. It's a picture, it's a public proclamation to the world around us, to heaven, to earth, and the world beneath, that we have moved from death to life. Water baptism is this wonderful expression that lets the whole world know that right now we have believed, we have received the forgiveness of sin, and we are now, we are now recipients of eternal life. And when we understand this baptism, when we understand this baptism, we can, it releases us to step into the fullness of all that God has for us. It releases us to step into spiritual maturity, the doctrine of water baptism. You see, I've been a Christian now for over 20 years, and I have seen lots of people go through the waters of baptism. I've seen testimony upon testimony upon testimony. And here's what I find to be a very fascinating thing. Some people, when they go through the waters of baptism, uh, they experience a, a weight coming off them. Some people, when they go through the waters of baptism, they, they experience this joy like they've never had before. Some people, when they go through the waters of baptism, they come out saying, oh, I just feel so clean and so pure. It's such an amazing experience. Some of them fall in love with God in a way that they never had before, and it is brilliant. And despite the interaction, despite the encounter, despite the experience, what I've noticed to be common in all of them is this, that after they've gone through the waters of baptism, they fall in love with Jesus and they grow in their maturity like never before. Friends, can I encourage us today that we've not been water baptized, that we need to ensure that we are water baptized. We need to ensure that we go through the waters of baptism. You know, next month we're going to be doing water baptisms in the life of our church. Can I encourage you to be part and parcel of that? If you haven't done that, you can register in the info point. You can register online. If you're watching online, you need to be part of that. And if you've already been water baptized, let me encourage you. It's a proclamation of faith that says, hey, I have received the forgiveness of sin and I've got eternal life and it can help me to grow in my spiritual maturity. Uh, very quickly, if we can have the band up, that would be great. The second baptism I want us to quickly look at today is this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As the name suggests, it simply means that we've been submerged in the person of the Holy Spirit. All the way through scripture, we see this in Luke chapter 3, verse 16. This is John speaking about Jesus, and he says this. Uh, John answered and said, I will baptize you with water, but one is coming who is more powerful than I. I am not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus in Acts chapter 4, verse 5 says this. He told them, wait for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in not many days from now. You see, the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is this, to clothe us with supernatural power and to anoint us for spiritual service. That is the whole purpose of it. It is the gateway, if you would, to the spiritual life. It is the gateway, if you would, to spiritual empowerment. It is the gateway to ensure that you and I are equipped and empowered so that we can live this Christian life effectively and victoriously. There's something about this experience that is powerful. It releases us into the supernatural lane that God wants us to live in. It's all found in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But, but this is what I want you to quickly catch. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a separate and subsequent event to salvation. It is separate and subsequent to salvation. What do I mean by that? It's, it's separate, meaning that it's different to the salvation experience. You know the experience, salvation experience, when you and I said yes to Jesus, when we believed in our heart, we confessed in our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Salvation, or rather the baptism of the Holy Spirit is separate to that event. But not only is it separate to that event, it's subsequent to Meaning that you and I can only receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit if you and I already have made a decision for Jesus. And here's the good news. If you're a Christian in this place, if you're a believer in Jesus, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is available to us all. We can all be baptized in the presence of the Holy Spirit as long as you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. But here's the cool thing. I'm just going to play this for a few more. You see, with water baptism, the evidence that you've been water baptized, that you've been baptized in water, is that you went into the water and you came out soaking wet. Who would have thought? Oh, that was a whoa moment, right? Like you, you've been through it, you go in and you come out, you're dripping everywhere, and someone puts a towel around you, and you pray to God it's not in winter because you'd be nice and cold. But here's the thing, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
The key evidence that you're baptized in the Holy Spirit is that you speak in tongues, or that you have a prayer language, or that you have a heavenly language. Acts chapter 2, verse 4 says this. Let me just read it to you. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages or other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. On the day of Pentecost, they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they all spoke in tongues. In Acts chapter 10 in the house of Cornelius, the Bible tells us that they were all baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they all spoke in tongues. In Acts 19, when people came to Paul and said, Paul, would you pray for us to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? The Bible tells us that 12 of them came to him and while they were talking to him, Paul prayed for them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they were all spoke in tongues. The key evidence that we're we have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit is simply the fact that we speak in tongues and we have a heavenly language. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Ade, why do I need to speak in tongues? Oh, I am so glad you asked. You need to speak in tongues because it releases the presence and the power of God in your life. My gosh, we, we need to speak in tongues because it edifies our spirit. It encourages us. Sometimes you go through a hard place and you go through a difficult moment and you don't know what to do and you just get in that space and you just go And all of a sudden on the inside of you joy just begins to rise. You all of a sudden feel empowered. You feel like you can do anything. You feel like Superman with a big S on your chest and you can make anything happen because you've been empowered by the person Oh, sorry, I just got excited. By the person of the Holy Spirit, we need the gift of speaking in tongues because sometimes we do not know what to pray. We don't know how to pray for our family. We don't know how to pray for our job. We don't know how to pray for our finances. We don't know how to pray for our healing. We don't know how to pray for our circumstance. And again, we get to that place in that separate place and we get down on our knees and we begin to call out to God and say, Lord, I got a family member that needs to know you as Lord and Savior. I lift them up to you, God. Lord, I don't know what to pray, but as I pray in the Holy Spirit, as I speak in tongues, I'm expecting something to shift in the atmosphere. As I speak in tongues, I'm expecting something to be released in the atmosphere. As I speak in tongues, I believe something to happen. Right now, Lord, I don't know what to pray, but I'm believing you to move on my behalf. Friends, can I encourage you today? We, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And here is the thing. When we understand the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when we experience whew, the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it opens the gateway for us to move towards spiritual maturity. Friends, we need to know the doctrines of baptism also need to experience the doctrines of baptism. As I draw to a conclusion this morning, if you and I are going to move from spiritual immaturity and move to spiritual maturity, if we're going to move from the milk of God's word and move to the meat of God's word, if you and I are going to move from the elementary teachings of Christ and move to the fullness of the counsel of God, then we need to make sure that we understand the doctrines of baptism, but also that we experience the doctrines of baptism. Friends, I'm saying to us today that we have to say to ourselves, I have decided to get baptized. I have decided to get baptized. Would you do me the honor this morning to stand to your feet wherever you are? I know for some of us this is very basic, we've been through this, we've heard it before. But again, there's a reason why it's called the elementary teachings of the faith. It's supposed to take us on a journey so that we can go towards spiritual maturity. There's a couple of things I need to do to end the sermon, really basic. First one is to give people an opportunity to know the same Jesus we've been talking about as Lord and Savior. Come on across this place with every head bowed and every eyes closed. 
maybe you're here in this space and you haven't made Jesus your Lord and Savior. You haven't believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You haven't believed that he died on the cross and that three days later he rose again. I need you to know, friend, that John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I need you to know, friend, that God loves you, that God cares about you, that God is concerned about you. I want you to know that Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says that while we're still sinners, while we're still far away from God, that God sent his son to die on the cross for us. And all we have to do to accept this forgiveness of sin, all we have to do to accept this eternal life is simply believe and confess. So as I look across this room today, Maybe you're here and say, Adai, today I want to put my heart in Jesus. I want to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to count to three. If you're watching from home, you can do this as well. When I count to three, I want you to do something bold and something brave and just to lift up your hand wherever you are. I want to pray with you. I want to know who I am praying for this moment. If you're at home, put your hand on your chest and we're going to say this prayer together. One, is there anybody in this place that wants to give their life to Jesus? Two, is there anybody in this place, as I look across this place, who wants to give their life to Jesus? Three, if that's you, come on, would you lift your hand as high as they go? Just quickly, yes, so I see that hand. Anybody else says, I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you used to be a Christ follower, but all of a sudden you find yourself away from God. Can I tell you, prodigal son, prodigal daughter, today is the day of salvation. You can come back home today. Today is the right day. One more time, is there anybody else that says, I want to give my life to Jesus as I look across the street? Fantastic. Church, can we say this prayer together? Just say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. Today, I put my trust in you. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are Lord. Give me a new heart and a new start. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, if you said that prayer, we're so elated and proud of you. We've got a team right there's going to be right up here. They want to give you a Bible. If you're watching online, go to our next steps page. We want to give you a Bible. But the last thing I want to do is this. You know, we talked about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're in this room. Just one more time, whatever you're about. If you've not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, would be evident to speak in tongues. I want to pray with you this morning. I just got faith to believe that today is your day where you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So if that's you, come on, we just lift your hands so we know who it is that's not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. We want to pray together. Be very grateful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So good. So good. Just what we had to do. Come on, we always lift our heads to heaven like this. We're just going to say a simple prayer. And then we're just going to believe. The Bible says that we can ask, we can pray, believe, and then we'll receive. So all that means is that after we say this prayer, you have to open your mouth and let the sound come out. And all of a sudden, God will move on your behalf. God doesn't move your tongue. You have to do the exercise, but the sound will come out in the name of Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I ask you today to baptize me with the Holy Spirit and with fire right now in Jesus. Now Ryan, yes. I think we're done for today. We're finished. Now don't forget to keep up to date with everything we're up to. You can check out our social media or on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and you can check out our website as well for any more information you may want. With that being said, we will see you guys next week. Yeah.